seated, please. Amen. John Scott, what did you major in when you went to ACU? Organizational communication, basically HR. HR, organizational communication. So I got a question for you guys because I didn't major in preaching or Bible or anything like that. And I, I think a lot of us, the thing we plan on doing or we major in or whether you go to college or not, when you're 18 or 19, your dream often changes or God often redirects you. Uh, if you're doing something other than what you majored in or planned on doing when you were 18 or 19, raise your hand, okay? So look around, seniors. Uh, <laughs> last night, Isla and I, I'll, I'll get to brag on my daughter a little bit. We were watching Claudia. There was a national competition in Los Angeles for graphic design. She won first place, so way to go, Claudia. And her team, she was on another two-person team, and they got second place, but, but she got first place, stood on the podium. It was great to watch that, but she didn't major in graphic design. She didn't take courses in graphic design. All I want to say is I know there's a lot of pressure, and what am I going to do, and, you know, oh, I gotta, I'm, I've got to be an accountant. I'm majoring in account. No, you don't. Um, hey, if it works out and you do for the rest of your life exactly what you start out doing your freshman year, great. But as we see, um, God may have other plans for you. And I would just say, be open to that. And we're going to encounter a story this morning of being open uh, to some surprising twists and turns. Uh, what was about to happen with Abraham and Sarah was something they would have never expected and uh, wouldn't have welcomed. But in the end, it turned out to be an amazing blessing for them. But let's start out this morning talking about names. There is great power in names. If I say a name like Tom Brady, uh, probably we're thinking goat, you know, the greatest of all time, the greatest football player of all time. Uh, there are names that really, Adele, uh, amazing voice, you know, there, the Elon Musk, eccentric millionaire. Uh, and I've told you guys before that I learned in a very personal way the power and importance of names when we moved to Brazil. Uh, I was born Gordon Wesley Dabbs and, and called Gordon my whole life, moved to Brazil, lived in a country where Gordon doesn't just mean obese, it means very obese. Gordon, Gordon. Uh, Gordo would be, would be kind of obese. Gordon is very obese. So I'm telling people my name is very obese. And it didn't work out well for me. So thank God for middle names. I was Wesley for 10 years. Uh, there is power in a name. Uh, and so... If you've had a child, some of us have, uh, it's, you put a lot of importance into choosing the right name. We used to have baby books, although now we have the internet, so you don't need to buy a baby name book, but you want to choose that right name. Like for us, Claudia, we wanted a name like Claudia that would work here in the U.S., that would work in Brazil as well, and so I think we chose well. We get to Genesis chapter 22, and we get a name for God that is so special and so relevant to our lives today, it's going to be a joy to unpack where this name come from this morning. It is the name Yahweh Yireh or Jehovah Jireh. And so we're going to see where that name comes from. It's a meaningful name because of the circumstances under which this name of the Lord was forged. And it is a name that comes from the most challenging, without a doubt, episode in the life of Abraham, and really probably one of the most challenging episodes in all of the Old Testament. So Genesis chapter 22, Abraham and Sarah, Sarah have welcomed the birth of this promised child, this remarkable child born to them in their senior citizen years. Uh, his name uh, was Isaac. Uh, and, and God comes to Abraham and says, by the way, Isaac wasn't a baby when this story happened. He had grown up a little bit, uh, at least 13, maybe even as old as 40 years old. Uh, Isaac was, was a man in Jewish terms. And Abraham is told, take Isaac and sacrifice Isaac, this child of promise, this one through whom all of the blessings of God are supposed to flow. Take him and sacrifice him to the Lord. Jewish people call this episode in Genesis 22 the Akedah, the binding, 
the Akedah. And it is a story that frankly makes people squirm. It is a story that has been used as ammunition by enemies of faith over the years to attack our beliefs because it is a story that at face value just seems wrong on so many levels. I took a philosophy class in college. We had a visiting professor from New York, State University of New York, Paul Kurtz, a PhD in philosophy, this guy, and he'd written books and he was a well-known atheist and loved to convince people that their idea that there is a God is an irrational idea. And one of his favorite stories to prove his point is from Genesis 22. What kind of God would ask someone to sacrifice their child? That cannot be his reasoning, a a good God. Uh, So he concluded that the foundation's of Judeo-Christian faith are flawed and are basically immoral, are at odds with basic human decency. Uh, So today's story from the life of Abraham is the story of the Akedah, the binding of Isaac. And it is a story that Kurtz and others have used to attack our faith. He said this, Paul Kurtz, if we reflect upon the situation, we cannot help but be dismayed that God would so cruelly test Abraham and that Abraham would consider killing Isaac. It is clearly morally wrong for a father to sacrifice his son. So he says uh, that the story we're going to talk about this morning is proof or at least evidence that biblical faith is anti-moral. And when it comes to Genesis chapter 22, there is no doubt it is a story that is difficult to grapple with. It is a story that takes a bit for us to get our minds and hearts wrapped around, but it is one of those stories in Scripture that really to understand what's going on, faith is a prerequisite. Like you're not going to understand this story unless you come at it from a posture of faith in the living God. Uh, Any other way, you're just going to see cruelty and confusion. Um, So, I'm going to give you a quote that I shared a couple weeks ago with some of you. It comes from, it's an old quote from a theologian, Anselm of Canterbury, a.k.a. Saint Anselm. And he talks about these places where you have to have faith in order to reach understanding. And he said this, I don't understand so that I might believe, but I believe so that I might understand. There are realms of understanding and clarity that we only arrive at when we look through the prism of faith. And this is one of them in Genesis chapter 22. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he said, here am I. He said, take your son Your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah. Offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him, and his son, Isaac. So, again... Abraham and Sarah had been waiting for years and years to have a child together, and God had promised they would, but the thing was taking so long to come about. And in their old age, they finally welcomed this child of promise and power in a name, right? They gave him a name that fit perfectly because even they saw the comedy in the situation of these retirement uh, home parents giving birth to a child. They named this son Isaac, literally laughter. They saw the humor in it. They rejoiced in the creativity and the wonder of a God who who could still surprise them, even in their old age. And so the one who Abraham had trusted, had believed on, this one had delivered. And they finally welcomed this miracle child. And then God said, I need you to sacrifice the child. Abraham walked in obedience, didn't argue, didn't debate, set out with Isaac and two servants toward Mount Moriah. After some miles had been traveled, Abraham told his servants, you guys stay put. 
from this point forward, it will just be me and Isaac going together. Uh, but there's some clues in here about the faith of this patriarch. Genesis 22, 5, stay here. He told the servants, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and, and this is a very important and, we will go over there and worship and come back to you. My son and I are coming back. Now, you can take the easy road here, and you can say, Abraham knew the whole time that God was going to call this off. He knew the whole time that he would not actually have to sacrifice his son, but that is an easy road that Scripture really doesn't give us. There's no evidence in Scripture that Abraham believed that. In fact, we are told in Scripture something different about this, that he had, <laughs> he had such remarkable faith that Abraham believed his thinking was God will raise Isaac from the dead after I sacrifice Isaac. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 9, he considered, 19, he considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead. Had anyone ever been raised from the dead at that point in history? No, it had never happened. But Abraham reasoned that this El Shaddai, this God Almighty, could make even that happen and that he would make that happen. And so he believed, he trusted, he had faith in God all the way. And so they journey to Mount Moriah. We were there last week, me and a group of you guys. Uh, it's where the Dome of the Rock is right now, where this rock inside this dome is the place Jewish people believe to be the place Abraham bound Isaac and was going to sacrifice his son. And this spot on Mount Moriah would become the place where sacrifices were offered by the Jewish people there at the temple for centuries and centuries to come after this. Um, but yeah, there on Mount Moriah, Abraham assembled an altar. Isaac wondered, Father, uh, I see the altar. I see that we've got everything set up. But where is the, where's the lamb? Where is the goat that will be sacrificed? Abraham then bound his son, the Akedah, and he placed his son on top of that altar. Abraham held that knife in his hand. He lifted it up, and then the angel of the Lord stayed his hand. Abraham, Abraham, don't harm the boy. What a relief, right? Don't harm the boy. Now I know that you fear God, that you believe in the Lord. So right then, right there, Abraham noticed a ram caught in a bush. How convenient, right? God had set this up perfectly. There was a ram caught in a bush. He took it and he sacrificed that, lamb, that ram instead of his son. And then Abraham worshiped the Lord Chapter 22, verse 14. So Abraham called the name of the place Yahweh Yireh. The Lord will provide. As it is to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. So we keep going back to what Scripture says about this individual, Abraham. That his faith was credited to him as what? As righteousness, that his belief in God became righteousness for him. And there on the Mount of Sacrifice, on the Mount Moriah in Jerusalem, he gave God a new name, Jehovah Jireh, the one who provides, the one who supplies. And I come to this incredible, challenging story in Genesis 22. I come as a person of faith. My understanding doesn't take me to faith. My faith takes me to understanding. And here's what I see going on. I see someone who trusted God 100% with his whole heart. I see someone who, who, when he and Sarah had received this child of promise, this miracle that was now part of the, their family, believed in God that even if this child died, he would be raised from death. He trusted God in the middle of a very difficult season. He trusted God when he had to offer to God that which mattered most to him. 
He believed in God when God required that which was most precious. He trusted God when his dream had finally become real and God said, offer that dream up. That's faith. He trusted God in a new and fresh way at the end of this encounter when his dream was spared at the last moment. When instead of mourning the death of Isaac, he and his son were able to worship God together on top of Mount Moriah. Some people have a fair weather faith. When everything's going great, when all of their checklist of prayers are getting answered, oh, they worship God, they love God. And others have a real faith, a solid faith, a biblical faith, an authentic, authentic faith that trusts God in whichever season they find themselves. That's Abraham. A faith that trusts God in all circumstances is a real faith, a biblical faith. And this is a trust, it's a trust that God holds us together when everything else falls apart. Now, let me ask you something. Did Abraham know how God was going to work everything out? Well, no. His idea about how it might have happened, it, that was not what ended up happening. He didn't know that God would stay his hand. He didn't know that there would be a substitute a ram caught in the briars. He didn't see God's playbook. He didn't know the plan that God had for his life. And let me ask you something. Do you trust God in this way? Do you trust God when you don't see all of the details, the, the planning day by day that God has for your life going forward? Can you trust God even then? I hope so. That's biblical faith. In 2005, I needed to raise money. I needed to raise a lot of money. On our mission team, I was kind of the main fundraiser. And so I had prepared for months to come back to the U.S. and ask the American partners to kind of do their part. Uh, the Brazilian church had stepped up. It was time for the American partners to step in and help us out to raise money to buy land. And so I needed to raise a lot of money. I came back and there were meetings set up in, in Edmond and there were meetings set up in Norman and, and in Texas there were meetings set up. And so I'm there, and, and, and the first meeting, I had about 30 people there. It was a total bust. Total bust. A friend of mine who had been a professor of mine at OC handed me a $25 check. That was it. I needed to raise $600,000, okay? $25. Thank you. I mean, I really was grateful. I love that guy. And I know for him, it was a sacrifice. They were not wealthy people or anything. But, and then I'm headed down to tech, South Texas, and someone uh, called me and said, hey, by the way, there's a meeting at Webb Chapel. Uh, there's a missionary luncheon going on, and we're just at the, you know, come on by. Stop on by and say hi to people. People you know are going to be there. So I stopped off for lunch at Webb Chapel on my way down to South Texas. <clears throat> and the luncheon happens, and there's a speaker, and it's good, and everybody's enjoying some some chicken and, you know, all this mashed potatoes and stuff, and it's over, and they're like, hey, missionaries, if, if each of you want to take a minute to share a little bit about what's going on in your work, step up and do that. So there are five or six of us. Here's what's going on. You know, I get up there and I say, you know, <clears throat> uh, work in Rio's going well, raising money for a building right now. That's why I'm back here. And then, you know, amen, everything is over. And a guy comes up to me uh, as, as people are clearing out, and I had never met this man before. He says, hey, my name is, mm, and he said, I, so you guys are raising money for a building. I said, yes, we are. He said, well, how much do, would, would you like for my wife and I to give you? That's a hard question. <laughs> I don't know you. I don't know how deep those pockets are. I certainly don't want to underbid, and I don't want to embarrass us both by, like, overbidding or something. So I said, $30,000. He said, okay, we can do that. Wow. Maybe I should have asked for 60, right? <clears throat> I got to tell you, I went back out to my car, and I just wept and worshiped God, the God who provides. Jehovah Jireh. It was amazing. 
All of the plans that I had made were coming to nothing, but God had other things planned that were way better. Got down to South Texas, and I was going to meet with someone, again, who I didn't know personally, but I was going to meet with somebody. I had my presentation. I had my, my you know, handouts. I had everything ready to go to persuade this guy to help us out. I walked in. His, his assistant let me into his office, walked in, sat down. He said, hey, before anything else, I just want to say my wife and I have prayed about you guys and your work, and I got a $100,000 check for you today. So make sure to pick that up on your way out. And I was like, (laughs) (laughs) nothing that I had prepared, nothing that I had planned ended up really mattering. God needed to show us this was his work. He would be the provider. He would be the one who took care of everything. And I, I, I look back on that And I think, you know, the only thing I did was show up with my hands out. (laughs) It's what fundraisers do. You show up with your hands out. And that's what I did in two days. I had $130,000 in my pocket that I had nothing to do with. And it was amazing. Praise God for that. We make our plans, right? And we should make our plans, We should develop our game plans. We work hard to pull them off. We should work hard to pull them off. Nothing wrong with that. Just know it's always God who provides. It's always God who provides. We are at our best, I believe, and this story about Abraham's life shows up. We are at our best when we show up with our hands out. When we show up and we, we know we have nothing to offer God, we have no bargaining power, we're not in a position to leverage anything, we show up to worship with our hands out. We show up to pray with our hands out. To a dying world, we show up with our hands out, offering the Father's love. And I want to challenge you, a life of faith, seniors and all of us, a life of faith doesn't mean we get to see the playbook of exactly what God is going to do and his timeline. It does not mean that. Like Abraham, we go through seasons of life where things are going well and seasons of life where things are, in our opinion, certainly not going so well. And here's the thing. This is the challenge of Genesis chapter 22. And it only makes sense when I look at it through the lens of another struggle that took place on that mountain, on that holy mountain, Mount Moriah. Centuries later, another child, another son would be placed on an altar. Jesus, Lamb of God, would willingly offer his life up to redeem us. Jesus showed up with his hands out. He showed up with his hands out, believing the Father would provide trusting your will, not my will, believing that the Father could provide redemption through the world, really the fulfillment of the promise Abraham had received so many centuries earlier, that that promise would be fulfilled through him on the cross, that God would provide, that he would supply humanity with that which we most needed, salvation, redemption. And Jesus' sacrifice, unlike the ram that was offered and so many other doves and rams and sheep that would be offered for centuries to come in that spot on Mount Moriah, the sacrifice of Jesus was the one they all foreshadowed, was the one that they all pointed to. This is the one, the Lamb of God, Jesus. As a person of faith, I can't help but see parallels gospel parallels in Genesis 22. Isaac and Jesus, these two promised sons, these two miracle children had so much in common. Both Isaac and Jesus were precious to their father. Both Isaac and Jesus went to the altar willingly Both Isaac and Jesus carried wood for their sacrifice up to the top of the mountain. Both were offered to God, were put on an altar on Mount Moriah, and both were delivered from death there on the third day. That deliverance from God that Abraham expected, uh, that Isaac would be resurrected, that, that 
crazy belief. It actually came true centuries later through Jesus when there was a resurrection from the dead. Ultimately, our faith is oriented around Jesus. No matter what happens in the next four years at college, no matter what happens as you enter military service or you look for a job, no matter what happens in the here and now, his provision is enough. It is sufficient. Abraham named that place God Provides. I love that. Abraham could have made this place about him. He could have named that place, my struggle. He could have named that place, the place where I worshiped. He could have named that place, my great faith. He didn't. He knew it was about God. This place is the place God provides. And your life is that place where God provides in all seasons. Through Jesus, God has already provided that which you and I most need. Salvation, forgiveness of sins, eternal life through him. And so maybe this morning you need to take that step of faith and put on Jesus in baptism. Wear his name and claim him as the Lord of your life. You could do that today. Maybe you just need prayers about something going on. It could be something you're celebrating. It could be something you're struggling with. We are a house of prayer at Preston Crest. We would love to pray for you and over you. Uh, Gather with somebody, pray, come down and pray with me, one of our shepherds. Maybe this morning you want to know about being a member of the Preston Crest Church. We would love to welcome you into our family. We'd love to talk with you about next steps, however you need to respond. Let's stand together and let's worship Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. Lord, I know. I know.